All righty, here we go. Uh, aloha to you all today. Um, I'm sort of going to kind of continue on this uh, road of comparison of the two sides of the political spectrum uh, to give you a balanced view, try to give you uh, uh, some thoughts about both sides, where both sides today sort of come from. One of the interesting things that, uh, one of the interesting uh, social movements of the early 20th century, really the late 19th century, was something called the progressive movement. Now we hear the term, uh, the progressives, used quite a bit uh, in modern politics. So where does it come from? What does that mean? Uh, what's that situation where it grew out of? So let's take a look at that. Um, a lot of people at the beginning of the 20th century sort of looked back, uh, and so in, you know, 20th century, so I'm talking about the 1900s. So they kind of looked back in the 1800s and they said, uh, okay, well, we've read this guy, Karl Marx, and uh, he's very interesting and we kind of like that. Uh, and then we sort of see things bleed into the uh, violence of the Russian Revolution and how bad that was. And some people said, oh, whoa, whoa, that's a little bit too much. We're sort of in favor of this kind of Marxian theory, uh, but we don't want, we're not uh, willing to uh, start a revolution. Let's see if we can do it in a sort of, dare I say, lighter fashion. So this is a political movement that sort of uh, uh, was in the vein of the left side of the political spectrum, on the Marxist side of the political spectrum but maybe it didn't go quite as far. Maybe it wasn't, uh, certainly it wasn't this desire for violence like the um, Marxist movement, dare I call it. So this is a movement that we mostly see uh, in the United States, but certainly uh, we see it in Western Europe. Um, certainly it was the, uh, something going on there. And look, this also in this same sort of Marxian way, uh, Marx of course recognized that industrialization was a major aspect of the world he was seeing. Remember, he's, he's alive in the middle of the 1800s. Uh, he is seeing industrialization on the rise, especially in, uh, certainly in Europe, but especially in his home country of Germany. And so he sees the world modernizing. And that's something that the uh, progressive movement, just by its very nature, of the term progressive, what is progressive? I mean, well, obviously, what's the root of that word, I guess we could say? Well, progress. So people who are progressive say we want to make progress and they look at modernization and how the world is modernizing and how uh, the scientific revolution, uh, which of course started in the 1500s and 1600s, has certainly improved the world and modernized the world. And so we should go forward and we should stop looking backwards. And one of the main things and probably the most critical thing you should understand about the progressive movement, especially in the United States, is that aspect of, hey, we're looking forward, we're not gonna look backwards. They implicitly, and without a doubt, reject the concept of the founding of the United States. They, uh, they disagree wholeheartedly and openly with the founding fathers of the United States. All right, so now this is sometimes a little bit surprising for students when they first hear that, but just sort of listen to what I'm gonna go through here as they would make the argument that the founding concept of limited government and the freedom, uh, that your freedom comes from uh, the, your creator, they would argue those are, yes, traditional arguments, but those are past tense. Uh, those are not things we can be talking about in the modern, industrialized, science-dominated world. We need to move forward from these concepts, and we need to understand that uh, one of the things that they also disagree with is the consent principle. Now, what is the consent? Well, you, you, may, you are probably familiar with the line uh, that governments uh, only should operate based on the consent of those they govern. So that's a founding principle. Uh, progressives are completely against that. They do not think that is correct at all. In fact, they think the exact opposite. Uh, really, a progressive would argue you are not born free. And this is the argument between when are you equal? Are you equal at the, uh, uh, at the beginning or are you equal at the end? Equal opportunities or equal Outcomes. So the progressives are equal outcome people. Uh, the opposite side, the conservative side, would be the equal uh, opportunity side. You're equal at the beginning. You're 
uh, of course, all men are created equal. Created implies beginning. That's something that comes, uh, the progressives do not agree with. They believe that freedom is a product of human making is the way I'm going to describe this. In other words, you are not free until society helps you to get free. And the state has got to be very critical in that aspect. And that state institutions are really the purpose of state institutions, i.e., namely governments, are there to help people reach their potential. That certainly you cannot reach your potential at, you're, you're not going to have your potential reached at birth. Your potential will be released sometime later on. Uh, that will be an outcome aspect of your life, not an opportunity aspect of your life. Okay? So the state is incredibly important to a uh, progressive. And so here again, you start to see the concept of, well, okay, let's, we need a big, active, uh, super body powered government to help people to be equal, to reach their potential, things like that. Who should run the government? Okay, well, this kind of thing goes all the way back to Plato. Uh, certainly, um, certainly, all the great utopia believers of history uh, believe this. Uh, all the great dictators made the same sort of argument. But Plato was really sort of the first one who talked about this is that. Um, this concept of a philosopher king. Uh, the, the only the most intelligent should be running the show. Uh, only the most well-educated should be in charge. Those are the people that we should have running our society, have running the state, uh, that will, these institutions that will help people become equal, uh, reach their full potential, uh, will all be cared for. So when you say that, what you're talking about is you're getting away from the founding concepts of not only three branches of government, but three levels of government. So you have three branches, executive, legislative, judicial, but you also have those things at three levels. You have them at the federal level, you have them at the state level, and you have them at the local level. Well, a progressive would argue we should worry about the highest levels first and foremost. They're really against branches as well, but really what they're getting at is this is only going to be achieved if we maintain this kind of aspect at the highest levels. Get the best people to the highest levels as soon as possible. So we don't need as much voting for local officials. Uh, there needs to be more voting for central governments. Uh, central government officials and voting for those types of people are um, the critical, critical uh, elements of a society that will have the big active Care for caring for all government type that progressives like. So progressives don't like private sector stuff. They like public sector stuff. They see uh, um, progressives see private sector as the places of self selfishness and greed, and they see private sector, uh, in other words, individual free enterprise, uh, private business ownership as a place where. Uh, those who are uh, at the top are taking advantage and oppressing those uh, that are below them, that are working for them. This is the oppression of the workers that you go back. This is another connection back to Karl Marx, as you can see here. Okay? Uh, so they don't like monopolies. Um, and, and we, look, we started to see, if you recall, the four guys, the... Uh, the Carnegies and the Morgans and the Vanderbilts uh, and that crew of guys that we sort of talked about earlier, uh, the Rockefellers, they sort of created monopolies of things um, where they cornered entire businesses. And I think most Americans agree that monopolies were not, are, are not and they were not good. So they attacked those. One of the greatest uh, uh, monopolies at this time, at sort of the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, was the railroad system, especially at the end of the 1800s. And so the breakup of the big railroad companies into uh, smaller groups was uh, one of the great, uh, I suppose you could argue one of the great uh, accomplishments of the progressive movement. Something that the uh, progressive movement hates and you hear this discussed in modern times is the discussion of the electoral college and why do we have that? This is a, 
Uh, this is one of these throwback things that the founders came up with that uh, progressives say are things of the past that should be tossed aside. We don't need these anymore. Um, if you are interested in an argument in favor of the Electoral College, you should watch my movie, Political Spectrum Number 4. Uh, excuse me, Political Spectrum Number 5. I call it uh, Election Night. And there is an ex explanation in there that is a defense of the Electoral College. Uh, but you can see that this will be an aspect where this would be, uh, the Electoral College really breaks things down to a smaller level, not necessarily local, but a state level. And you can see that is something that progressives are against. They don't like the excesses of capitalism. Again, if uh, uh, the argument that uh, the same thing I just made a point about up here, about that it um, increases the uh, allowance of those that are at the top to take advantage of those below them, uh, the, the industrialists, the capitalists to take advantage of the worker, etc. Some of the things that progressives absolutely loved and adored are things like inner city projects. All right, uh, they thought those things were of value, and those are the types of things that they were certainly big supporters of. Uh, they weren't necessarily supporters of the monopolies and the way uh, factories and things like that within inner cities, within the big cities were run. Um, but certainly they like inner city projects, uh, those that claim to help the folks, the poor aspects of the inner cities. They loved the women's suffrage movement. Um, this is, the, this is uh, the movement for the right of women to vote. Uh, women d deserved the right to vote. Uh, I think looking back today, no, nobody disagrees with that. Uh, but they were early champions of the women's suffrage movement. Uh, they were believers in, they are great believers in the concept of a progressive taxation rate. Uh, what does that mean? That means, well, uh, the more income you make, uh, the higher your tax rate. The less income you make, the lower your tax rate. This is the opposite of a flat tax in which, for example, a doesn't matter how much you earn, whether you're poor or rich, everybody say, pays basically at the same rate. Uh, something else that the, uh, you might find this interesting, uh, something else that the uh, progressive love was something called the temperance movement. What is the temperance movement? Well, the temperance movement was the uh, concept of, maybe you've heard of it, prohibition. Now, what is Prohibition. Well, if you look carefully at the word prohibition, you can see the word prohibit. So this was a time period during the uh, 1920s where alcohol was outlawed. Uh, prohibition was a time period that alcohol was not allowed. Uh, it was against the law to drink alcohol. Um, so you, you were in temperance. You held back. You didn't uh, uh, allow yourself to get caught up in that uh, way of life. Uh, you should probably not be surprised when I tell you this, is that the um, progressive movement loves labor unions. And we have discussed in this, um, we have discussed in this text, uh, in this uh, class, in this course about labor unions and their growth, uh, their birth really, after the Industrial Revolution gets started. So the progressives were big fans of labor unions. What are some of the examples of uh, early American progressives? Uh, well, I would say that the best examples would have to be these three presidents. Uh, now, what's interesting is that the first one I have listed right there, uh, Roosevelt, it was actually a re Republican uh, and was a, a, actually a Republican president. Uh, after he was president, he ran again later on but he actually ran as a progressive. Uh, Roosevelt was very much responsible for breaking up of uh, the monopolies, uh, especially of the railroads. Um, but I think the best example of an early American progressive was Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was a, um, he was a very well-educated, very intelligent person. Uh, he at one time was the president of Princeton University uh, and he was a very blatant and open uh, believer in the progressive movement. He was very open about his rejection of the founding uh, and how we should move on from the founding documents. He made no bones about it. 
uh, and really when you study the progressive movement and today progressives look at, hey, progressives look at Wilson as one of their heroes. So he is the main person I would say if I were to talk about somebody you want to go back and you really want to study this in more detail, you should go back and study the life and the thoughts of President Wilson. All right. And he was president, I believe, from uh, 1912 is when he was elected. So 1912 to uh, 1920. All right. He was the president during World War One. We talk about him when we discuss World War One. All right. What is the importance of the progressive movement? Well, I'm glad you asked that. So I would say to you that if you sort of think about American history, they uh, the progressives, as they originally sort of were founded, were going against the mold. They were going against uh, American tradition. And I would sort of say that uh, Americans, uh, and I think you could make this argument still today, generally Americans distrust government involvement in private affairs. And this goes back to the founding. This is really what the founding was all about. Those uh, guys at the beginning of American history who started the country, they were interested in being de-shackled, if you will, from the uh, oppressive, what they called oppressiveness of the British government, the British crown rule upon what they were trying to accomplish in their private affairs in the colonies. Um, and so that has sort of been the basis of the United States. And so I would sort of say that is sort of traditionally what most Americans think. So the progressive movement went against that. And it, you would have to argue, I think, that the progressive movement ha has been, uh, or shall I say was, extremely successful. Uh, they had several very impressive early accomplishments. And one of those, and maybe you, may, uh, you might be surprised by this when I tell you this, and that is the 16th Amendment. Maybe you didn't know this because we think of taxation as just normal, uh, income tax, uh, a tax on somebody's earnings, we just think of that as completely normal. That is really a, a recent uh, phenomenon in American history. Less than half of American history has had an income tax. The 16th Amendment uh, was added. By the way, this is uh, after Woodrow Wilson was a elected president, I might add. Um, uh, so the income tax amendment uh, is one of the great accomplishments. Uh, when you have taxation, what is going to happen to the size of government? When you increase taxation, when you say we're going to bring in more tax, what is the government basically implying? It wants to grow. Uh, the 19th Amendment is the right to vote for women. This was also passed during the time of uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, the right to vote for women was passed during this time. And, uh, you know, again, this is sort of a belief that women would generally vote uh, to the left, on the left side of the political spectrum. So uh, progressives were very much interested in getting uh, women the right to vote. And look, I should probably say this, part of this is, you know, black African-American males were allowed to vote. And generally in this time period, African-American males were voting Republican because it was Lincoln, the very first Republican who freed the slaves in their mind. And so what they said, black um, African-Americans, males, were voting Republican. What do the liberals want? They need a voting block. Okay, we believe women will be that voting block. Let's get them in. Uh, and that was part of it as well. But I think certainly the vast, the main reason you, this happened is that women deserve the right to vote. Now, this is not just an American thing. Progressives, uh, uh, progressives certainly... Um, uh, occurred, the progressive movement occurred, uh, obviously in Europe would be the best place to see this. And many of the, what we would call the European oligarchies uh, um, that were foundational around socialism uh, liked U.S. progressives and U.S. progressives liked many of the European socialist oligarchies. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going around before World War II about how, uh, you know, there was a, there were love affairs between U.S. progressives and European socialists of all kinds, and they both liked each other's plans and they liked the different things that each side did. And there's lots of articles to be found uh, of uh, American progressive authors and uh, uh, 
media writing glowing uh, articles about how wonderful European socialism was going. Uh, progressives love Mussolini. Progressives in America love Mussolini, for example. Okay. All right. So, what are some examples of other types of accomplishments? Well. You would have to go to, so this is letter D, you would have to go to the 1930s, all right? So uh, the 1930s is the next place where we see the great aspect of progressivism. So one of the things we'll eventually get to is this guy, Franklin Roosevelt, um, the 32nd president of the United States, and he is the president during the um, Great Depression. So we'll get into something called the New Deal, and the New Deal was a bunch of... Uh, Basically, the best way for me to put it to you is a bunch of, uh, this is just a couple of them, just a bunch of new government, uh, big government programs to get people back to work. So FDR's uh, New Deal. We should also talk about Johnson's Great Society. This is something uh, else we'll get to. The Great Society was in the 1960s. Uh, we really sort of associate it with uh, the Civil Rights Act was an aspect of this. The Voting Rights Act, where this is where we start to see things like Medicare and Medicaid and things that you've probably heard of. So this is, again, these are two examples, two great examples of the increase in government. You could even go so far as to talk about when Obama was the president. And he, uh, he was a, we name it after him, but there were lots of Democrats and liberals in the United States and in, uh, in during that time who believed in what is ultimately a single system of, medic, of uh, health uh, care in the country, uh, more of a government takeover of health care. And this is, you have to understand that health care is a massively huge aspect of the American economy. Uh, a lot of hospitals, obviously a lot of doctors are private. Uh, they're private enterprises, okay? So the government takeover of Healthcare is a perfect example of how progressives sort of think things should happen. Again, this is the idea that everybody's cared for, that type of idea. All examples of the influence of the progressive movement. Okay? All right, so uh, here, here I'll just, let's uh, just sort of do some picture shot, uh, pictures here. Influence of the progressive movement. Uh, here's sort of the three guys I just sort of talked about. Okay? So the uh, guy in the middle is Woodrow Wilson. And you can see he's got his uh, pince nez. That's that idea that he's got those glasses that don't even have uh, rings around the ears and he just sort of pinches it onto his nose. So you can see this very distinguished Princeton guy. This is Franklin Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Of course, he was the president during World War II. He's the New Deal guy. This, of course, is Lyndon, uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, President, uh, Vice President to Kennedy, took over for Kennedy when Kennedy was assassinated. And then I'll just sort of show you this one last thing. You know, Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt was often seen in the back of a convertible. Uh, this is one of his famous pictures of him in the back of a convertible. Um, he's smoking a cigarette that's attached to some sort of filter or something like that. Well, Time Magazine uh, did this picture uh, one time during the Obama administration years, and you can see that what have they just done? They sort of superimposed Obama onto the, onto the same picture. What is the point here? The point here is the connection between the two, uh, dare I say, the two progressives, the two progressive, uh, this line of progressives from Wilson to Roosevelt to Johnson. You could probably throw Jimmy Carter in there all the way to Obama. Okay? All right, so there you sort of have it. The progressive movement, again, I would emphasize sort of this guy in the middle as being sort of the main person. Uh, but the progressive movement is certainly not, uh, not dead by a long shot. It is still with us very much today. Uh, there's a lot of people that are starting to call themselves progressives uh, in modern American society. You should know what it's about and you should be aware of what it's about. Hopefully you have a better feeling after listening to this. All right, folks. We will talk to you next time.